four decades into one that has trained many of the current leaders in the field worldwide and has helped challenge nationalistic academic borders by bringing faculty members from all continents to teach at Berkeley. Professor Dundee's published more than 250 scholarly articles and more than 20 books. His influence, he influenced the structural analysis of folklore, the ethnography of speaking folklore, and particularly his really favorite area, the psychoanalytic study of folklore. Um, and we actually have a couple of ways um, of being able to celebrate his legacy. One is with an annual Alan Dundee's lecture, which we have today. And you see I'm warming up actually for a little advertisement here. We also have the Alan Dundee's um, Graduate Fellowship. Cameron Johnson is the current Alan Dundee's Fellow. And today happens to be a Berkeley's big give, and so we would be welcoming you to give to the Alan Dundee's um, the scholarship, the fellowship endowment, if you are so motivated, I'd be happy to give you any information after talk about that. End of advertisement. In introducing our speaker today, I'm reminded of a couple of verses from the Ballad of Gregorio Cortes, which is the subject of the famous book by Don Américo Paredes, Dr. McDowell's teacher. Um, this, and so these lines are, Pero alcanzar a Gregorio Cortes era seguir a una estrella. But trying to overtake Cortes was like following a star. And uh, without, to be sure, putting myself in the position of a Texas Ranger, um, I would say, or turning Dr. McDowell into a folkloric, um, heroic fugitive, trying to introduce him briefly is about the same level of monumental task. Um, first, the facts. After receiving a bachelor's degree at Swarthmore College, he took his doctorate in anthropology and folklore at the University of Texas, Austin. He has taught um, for decades at Indiana University in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, and he chaired that um, department for something like a dozen years and seems to have survived quite well. <laughs> he has received many honors, including being named as a Fellow of the American Folklore Society, a Guggenheim Fellow, Fulbright Fellow, a Fulbright Hayes Fellow, and won the Chicago Folklore Prize in addition to teaching awards and most recently has received one of the greatest honors of his career, which is to be named as the visiting professor of folklore and anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, 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 it's a great treat to have him with us, not simply tonight, but also during this entire semester. Now, I would run out of time if I tried to just read the titles of his books, let alone try to summarize them. They began with children's riddling, a book that it probably stands is the most ethnographically rich study of the riddle genre, unless we count J.R. Tolkien's description of the contest before, uh, between Gollum and, Bil and Bilbo in The Hobbit. His text, um, uh, his work also, his next book took him out of Austin, um, where he explored the riddles, to the fascinating Sibundoy Valley of southern Colombia, where he moved on to proverbs or proverb-like uh, expressions, the focus of his 1989 sayings of the ancestors the spiritual life of the Sibundoy Indians. There he learned two indigenous languages, Kamsa, classified as a linguistic isolate, and a language in another language forming part of the Quechua family. Proverbs are a genre of folklore where careful ethnographic study of how texts emerge, not only emerging, but shape daily life is absolutely rare. Um, given how quickly they go by, documenting them and figuring out how they form part of spiritual, mythological, and folk medicine is not easy, but rather than a study of linguistic artifacts, sayings is a fascinating study of how life worlds can be made by textured um, uh, meanings of poetic words turned into interactional and collective building blocks. Andean Cosmologies Through Time, published in 1992, then took up the fascinating question of how Andean peoples could face five centuries of colonialism and violence, and still, in Nancy Reagan's famous words, just say no, um, sometimes in subtle and quiet ways, to the constant demand to capitulate to the idea that there is only one, to use the current expression, ontology. Until recent um, much work on ontologies, however, this book has, I think, in some ways more richly answered that question by looking closely at poetics rather than immediately resorting to quick summaries of evil, evilly abstracted ontological binary principles. Folklorists and others have published libraries on myth, but few have bothered to look ethnographically 
and help the mythic performances unfold in the course of both daily life and ritual, but Dr. McDowell's book, So Wise Were Our Elders, Mythic Narratives of the Kamsa, does precisely that. There, he got about halfway back, then he got about halfway back to Austin, Texas, that is as far as the Costa Chica of Mexico, where he ethnographically studied the genre that, as I initially mentioned, Don Américo Paredes had pioneered. Um, Dr. Uh, McDowell's book, Poetry and Violence, looked not as did Paredes at corridos or ballads that kept historical memory of distance events and heroic resistance fighters alive, but the emergence of ballads about violence in African-Mexican communities that document and critically examine, rather than simply celebrate, violence, and in their performance and circulation, including through various media formats, shape collective understandings of violence, race, and nation. Corrido, the living ballad of Mexico's western coast, extends this research. Dr. McDowell then headed south, traveling to the Otavalo region of Ecuador, where he learned Otavalese Quechua, another language, and examined a community that has come to dominate the region where it was once marginalized, structure its own tourist market, and claim performance spaces for Andean musics around the world. I can tell you about the path-breaking articles he has published and how he has trained generations of students, but I won't because we would both rather listen to hear to him talk. All I would add is that he is one of the kindest and most personable human beings I know and have had the pleasure of calling a friend and even sharing a few adventures over a number of decades, adding that his talk, as you can see, is entitled Eco-Performativity, Expressive Culture at the Crux of Ecological Trauma. I ask you to join me in welcoming John McDowell. Allow me to introduce my old friend, Charles Briggs. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Charles is the guy that uh, runs the folklore program within the anthropology department here at Berkeley. And uh, he's been an old friend. In fact, Charles has been to the Sibinoy Valley of Columbia. And there aren't too many people I know who can say that. There's another one in the room. My wife, uh, Patricia, has been to the Sibinoy Valley. It's a great honor to be uh, giving this uh, talk, to be the uh, Alan Bundy's guest lecturer. Uh, he was a real giant among folklorists, and uh, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Prologue. At this critical juncture in the Anthropocene, we might ask if there's any way to stop advanced to global capitalism from devouring the earth and all that is on it, underneath it, and above it? Could it be that the voices of local and indigenous people with a deep connection to locale and land will be the David to vanquish or at least restrain this Goliath? Will these voices of marginalized, neglected, and often victimized communities amplified through a supportive chorus of well-meaning allies rise to stop the drilling stifle the pipelines and restore viability to the planet's life? <clears throat> there are many disappointments and occasional triumphs in this unequal struggle, but dramas playing out at hundreds of sites indicate that the juggernaut, for all its force, may grind to a halt. Ironically, in these typically isolated places and at the feet of these small but determined adversaries. The present exposition of locally rooted ecological discourse will, I hope, illuminate a social aesthetics at work in arenas of environmental conflict and helps explain how seemingly unequal confrontations at this moment, as Anna Singh reminds us, of extreme precarity can lead to surprising results. The Colombian anthropologist Gerardo Reichel Dolmatov is one among many who have drawn our attention to the entanglement of expressive culture and local belief systems with ecological understanding. He writes, Aboriginal cosmologies and myth structures represent in all respects a set of ecological principles. More recently, cosmologist and earth scholar Thomas Berry reminded us that, and I quote, Earth is a communion of subjects 
not a collection of objects. End of quote. And responding to the increasing severity of our global predicament, the Brazilian sociologist Boaventura Santos opines as follows. He says, we are confronting modern problems for which there are no modern <coughs> solutions. End of quote there. These observations set the table for the present contribution, an effort to formulate a structural model for assessing the potency of expressive culture in scenarios of environmental debate and conflict. Otavalu Runa and the Sacred Spring. Let's begin with a time, a place, and a people. In 2007, when visiting my Runa compadres in Iluman, one of the 70 or so indigenous settlements on the periphery of the city of Otavalo, in the northern sector of Ecuador, I walked one July afternoon with my family and some of our Otavalo friends to the bottom of the hill near the home of Luis Alberto Yamberla and Marupa Piquasi, where my wife and I and our son Michael were living to observe a ceremonial cleansing carried out by a group of yachaks, knowers, the spiritual guardians of the community. That's Ecuador, and uh, if you go up to near the top above Quito, which is the capital city very near the line where the equator passes, uh, you'll see Otavalo up there. And Ibarra, which we'll enter in a minute into the conversation, is up above Otavalo. And then just off the map, not far from Ibarra, is the border with Colombia. Here's some images of uh, the area around Iluman. This is Luis Alberto and Maruja, our closest friends when we were living in that area. And just so you can see that we were really there. <laughs> this is Pat as uh, her comadres insisted on dressing her as an indigenous woman. And uh, down in the lower corner there, that is me working with Alonso, another one of our very good friends, going over some of the materials that uh, we have been collecting. Back to my story, my story. We descended to Iluman Bajo and then crossed the national highway connecting Otavalo with Ibarra to come to the San Juan Sacred Spring, believed to possess immense spiritual power. There we witnessed a series of rituals performed by the Yachaks, intended to benefit the town of Iluman and more generally, the Runa community. The ritual actions included the pukui, the ritual blowing, also the breaking of a ceramic pot to spill auspicious elements into the air, and the placing of flowers and corn stalks where the spring waters emerged to favor their source, Taita and Babura, and to request a good harvest at the beginning of harvest season. Here are the Yachaks at San Juan, Pukyu, the sacred spring. This is the Pukui, the ritual blowing. You can see the ceramic pot of which I spoke in the foreground with the woman. Corn stalks at the uh, edge where the water comes out from the mountain. There's the stalks actually. The ritual actions of the Iluman Yachaks exhibit a measured control over human expressivity with language and gesture shaped into recurring patterns as well as a symbolic discourse evoking the core of Runa cosmology. At the heart of this discourse is a reverence for Taita and Babura, the volcano that towers over Runa settlements and is perceived to be a spiritual presence shaping human destinies. Taita and Babura could be uh, translated to mean Lord and Babura in this instance. Taita and Babura animates a sacred landscape with pukyus, springs, 
deep ravines, and other topographic features, serving as spiritually charged points of contact between the human and spiritual realms. Pokyu San Juan is one of the most significant of the numerous points of spiritual contact that dot the regional landscape. This cosmic feature on the landscape became a heated object of dispute between the Runa community and state authorities <coughs> due to a plan to widen the highway that passes between Iluman and the San Juan Sacred Spring. The standoff between the Runa and the government over a highway expansion project threatening the integrity of San Juan Pukyu and its ceremonial setting is emblematic of numerous comparable incidents throughout the Andean nations where local and indigenous curating of natural resources is pitted against development projects favored by regional elites and governmental authorities. The standoff at San Juan Pukyu was resolved when the authorities rerouted the highway expansion to avoid the sacred spring and the nearby hill where these rituals are performed, and also agreed to construct pasos peatones, pedestrian bridges that would allow people and their animals to traverse the widened highway without having to cross it. The runa even ended up with a chakana, a cosmic crossroads suitable for performing rituals at the site, now an attraction to residents and tourists alike. There's the Chakana, newly constructed with a ritual in progress. In the Yuluman case, as reported by Cultural Survival in July of 2010, I quote from that report, 180 indigenous families from the community mobilized to oppose the road expansion and were met by 350 police and riot gear sent from the provisional capital, Ibarra. There's an image of that. Taita Jose Rafael Carrascal Cacuango, president of the Asociación de Yachaks de Iluman, the Association of Yachaks of Iluman, spoke to Michelle Wibblesman, now a professor at Ohio State University, about the meaning of the sacred spring in these terms. There is a fuerza, strength, energy, one would say. The energy of the spring gives the people courage to discuss how to do something to have a voice and to have, deci have decision-making power. Previously, I had observed my compadre, Luis Alberto, including Pukyu San Juan among the sources of spiritual power in his curing chants. And his wife, Maruja, assured me that as she says, the water that emerges at San Juan Pukyu is pure since her grandparents taught her it comes from deep within Taita Imbabura. This is our son Michael getting cured not once but twice because uh, both times he went up into the ravines. We went up in the mountains a bit and Michael was clambering around in the ravines and he came down feeling sickly, feeling poorly and Maruja, uh, Alberto here, and then Maruja on the right, in each case performed a curing ritual, and he was cured. He felt better uh, right after um, they did that. Previewing the ritual en enactment we witnessed that day in July, Maruja explains how the Yachaks go to the, um, uh, to the San Juan Pukyu at the start of the corn harvest to initiate a year's round of sacred activities. They carry the corn stalk into the water to thank the gods for the year's crop. They bring a pot with burning coal, fragrant wood, and fragrant plants, she told us, as, in her words, una adoración al sol, al viento, a la temporada de la cosecha, to revere the sun, the wind, at the season of the harvest. The ideas that I want to carry forward here are that these highly patterned and carefully crafted ritual practices ensure a healthy connection to this spiritualized environment, and that this connection serves as a source of strength to the indigenous community in the face of outside encroachment on their physical domains. We can readily place the Otavalo case in the larger context of an Andean spirituality that draws on traditional knowledge and practice to identify and combat incursions that threaten the very resources that nurture these societies. In the present contribution to this cause, I tease out performative components of eco-spiritual 
and eco-pedagogic practices in the north central region of the Andes, where I have conducted my own ethnographic research, and even venture tentatively to be sure into the domain of eco-sovereignty. Eco-performativity, commu communicative power and efficacy. My purpose here is to establish the concept of eco-performativity founded on speech act theory as articulated by John Austin to account for the ways people construct discourse to make things happen with words. Thus, my articulation of eco-performativity eco begins with speech but immediately transitions from utterance to discourse so that we may accommodate the full spectrum of human expressivity. My intention is to explore how, envir how environmental connectivity is constructed through performance and how, <clears throat> how such performance is an emotional and intellectual resource as communities resist incursions that threaten the viability of their way of life. By tracing performative genres as they define, formulate, refine, and reinforce local systems of belief and practice, that is, as they constitute these systems, we can elaborate a detailed account of the creative processes and social dynamics that enable artful performances to articulate shared attitudes and beliefs in locally recognized expressive modes, and thereby shape people's thoughts and move them to action. Eco-performativity, eco then, allows us to explain how communicative acts focused on ecological relationships possess, when appropriately executed, enormous rhetorical power. Following the rubric established by John Austin's How to Do Things with Words, we can set out a set of conditions that must obtain if these expressions are to be felicitous, that is, if they are crafted so that they might achieve their intended impact. In Austin's formulation of speech act felicity, we attend to the person executing the speech act, the way the speech act is executed, and the circumstances in which the speech act transpires. To get at eco-performativity, I work this speech act protocol through the tenets of what I have termed commemorative discourse. Discourse featuring stylization in the medium of communication in tandem with a focus on core propositions of local worldview. Discourse with these attributes can attain remarkable levels of efficacy, well beyond the conveyance of information, an important function of communication, but as Roman Jakobson alerted us, hardly the only or most significant one. In shifting our attention from the referential to the performative, we embrace the well-documented rhetorical potentialities of artful communication, and beyond that, within context of local belief, its capacity through ritual practice to transform social status and even, it is sometimes believed, actual physical reality. Working this conceptual framework, we can track communicative elements like these. One, adherence to local expectations regarding the formal properties of communication. Two, referential content that articulates with community understandings of eco-spirituality. Three, the performer's standing as a person entitled to activate eco-pedagogy. And four, performance venues defined as appropriate by community standards. We can formulate these specifications in the framework of Austin Speech Act theory with reference to two parameters. The felicity conditions that must obtain for successful realizations of eco-performative acts and the range of potential effects, what Austin addresses as perlocution, which I will refer to as performance efficacy. Here is my rendering of the felicity conditions for eco-performative acts. A. The performance focuses, touches upon, or evokes the placement of humans in the environment. B, the performance draws on traditional values and knowledge. C, the performance is suitably stylized. D, the performance venue is deemed appropriate. And E, the performer has the required social standing. The broad framing of these felicity conditions is intended allowing for adjustment to discrete instances and their specific circumstances. Thus, for example, the stipulation on referential scope allows us to embrace eco-performativity 
in Acts displaying either explicit or implicit eco-spiritual content. When these conditions are met, we witness felicitous execution of eco-performative discourse, be it in the modality of speech, bodily movement, musical performance, visual representation, or any combination of these. From a methodological standpoint, these five conditions point us to critical dimensions of eco-performativity whenever and wherever it may occur. What about Austin's perlocutionary force in relation to eco-performative discourse, its capacity to make things happen? When we consider how people are influenced by performances they witness, we see that they receive and assimilate information, are emotionally affected by the experience, and in some cases are motivated to take action in response. We can identify a range of efficacy in eco-performative discourse. One, social efficacy that creates a sense of belonging and solidarity in the moment. Two, what we might call ceremonial efficacy, reaching beyond the moment to establish, shape, and affirm community. And three, a ritual efficacy that attends to people's relationship to other than human spiritual forces. Through the enactment and embodiment of shared knowledge and practice, participants in eco-performative moments become emotionally engaged as active agents in realities of their own making. One more point, a crucial one. The expressive genres associated with eco-performativity are conducive to these kinds of perlocutionary effect, and often we can observe a correlation between increased levels of stylization and heightened levels of performative impact, always subject, of course, to local aesthetic standards. For this reason, eco-performative discourse with highly stylized expressive contours, for example, in speech forms, words set to music or words spoken rhythmically in ritual settings, is especially prominent as individuals and communities respond to the trauma of environmental degradation. Heightened levels of intonational patterning and a palpable rhythmic pulse in oral performance, stylized motion of the body in dance, banners replete with pattern and evocative imagery. These and other crafted expressions can produce effects associated with such transcendent experiences as collective effervescence and communitas. There's a referential poignancy, but also a sensuous structuring in the medium of expression at the heart of eco-performativity. Carlos Tamabioy and the Cultural Production of Ecological Protest. I now offer, as a means for vetting these tenets of eco-performative discourse, a case study featuring the Sibindoy Valley of Colombia, where I will concentrate on the apotheosis of a cacique, an indigenous leader enshrined in local memory, who has emerged in the last two decades as a powerful ethno-political force and serves today as the focal point of Sibindoy eco-performative discourse. The Sibindoy Valley is a verdant, high-altitude valley in, the, in southwestern Colombia, home to two indigenous peoples, as Charles mentioned, the Ingas, speakers of the northernmost variety of the Quechua language family, and the Kamsa, speakers of a language isolate, derived from the archaic Kiyosinga family of languages. The map can convey the basic setting here in the far southwestern corner of Colombia. And here, the lower map is the valley of uh, Sibindoy, the Sibindoy Valley. When you come across the Panamo, uh, this is the region here on the western end of the valley where the Ingas reside. And then out here, more towards the center of the valley, is where the Kamsa indigenous community resides. We were there not long ago, and Pat uh, snapped this photograph. Michael has crept into the picture. Uh, this is my compadre, Francisco Sandioy, who came and taught at Indiana University for many years, was our Quechua teacher there. It's his daughter, Olga. And most of the others in the picture are members of the Cabildo of the Inga community in Santiago. The Cabildo is the, the town council uh, of the community. Carlos Tomabioy is celebrated in mythic narratives as a powerful spiritual ancestor, 
a native doctor with extraordinary powers, and in historical narratives as the benefactor who assured his people rights to their land, language, and culture. He has lately taken on a new role as iconic symbol of Sibundoy cultural survival in the face of modernity's destructive incursions. In the larger project, I trace the progress of this cacique from historical figure to solar deity, and finally to symbol of ecological resistance and ethnic persistence, highlighting eco-performativity that foregrounds an ancestrality, millenarianism, and eco-spirituality in formulating a discourse of ethnic resilience. Here we will have time only to sample one representative legend text and dip briefly into the eco-spiritual substrate that undergirds this discourse. I feature the text of a legend about Carlos Tomabioy, one of several I documented when I was a guest in the Sibundoy Valley. This one relayed informally one afternoon in July of 1978 by Taita Bautista Wahibioy, a distinguished Kamsat elder, six times governor of his community. I didn't know Taita Bautista, this is uh, when he was in his prime as governor of the community. This is around the time I first met him, and he's holding forth. He might actually be telling the legend that I'm about to share with you. I'm not certain. And this was uh, towards the end of the time that I knew him when he, um, it was wonderful to see him out in the uh, countryside. He would, he would be standing by some flowers and laughing, you know, so um, it's really a wonderful uh, sight, but a very extraordinary uh, individual. Taita Bautista was respected as a fountain of eco-spiritual knowledge, and I have among my documents his account of the weasel securing fire for the ancestors. He also had the story about the mouse obtaining a kernel of corn to share with the first people. In the narrative presented here, Taita Bautista turns his attention to the story of his people at the dawn of the modern age, after the arrival of the Europeans. These words of Taita Bautista resonated among the assembled group on a late afternoon in the Sibundoy Valley, stressing the need to averiguar bien, to get the story straight. He spoke of a grave mistake allowing Los Blancos, the whites, to dispossess the indigenous people of land that was legally theirs. Taita Bautista traces with care the scope of the lost domain, referring to significant landmarks, the impressive volcan Patascoy, Doña Juana, a massive peak to the north, and rivers and streams defining the local geography. He delivers this oral history lesson in the Kamsa language, but switches to Spanish to replay a memorable conversation when, he tells us, one of the Catholic missionaries put to him a poignant question. Taita Bautista's delivery throughout this performance is leisurely, almost methodical, as he pauses between utterances to let the irony or absurdity sink in. And I'm going to, I can hear Taita Bautista talking, I'm going to capture a little bit of that as I recall it in my reading of this uh, English translation of, his, of the text. This place is Carlos Tomabioy's. One has to know.